I want to welcome everyone. And um, this is the third session for um, the SPEAK, the first annual SPEAK Symposium. I am Dr. Rick Hofer, Director of SPEAK at the University of Texas at Arlington. We're really looking forward to this third session. We have uh, some great uh, younger scholars uh, who are going to tell us what the, uh, the next vision of, of this topic is. Uh, as you know, uh, SPEAK is the um, Social Policy, Education, Advocacy, and Knowledge uh, Project here at the University of Texas at Arlington. Uh, we gratefully acknowledge the support of the Simmons Sisters Fund at Texas Women's Foundation. We want to acknowledge the land on which our buildings stand, it's unceded and it's stolen territory from the native peoples in this area. We also acknowledge the grave harm brought by colonialism to this land, especially the systematic attempts to erase ind indigenous and African identities through slavery and racist segregating laws. I know that can sound um, like rehearsed and not sincere, but it's, it's so important to us in social work and uh, at SPEAK that we acknowledge that, that we are the beneficiaries of privileges that, that uh, have been taken from other folks. So um, I'd like to introduce the speakers for this session. I'm really excited to hear from them. We'll start with uh, Gary Parker. Gary is the Associate Dean of External Affairs and Director of the Clark Fox Policy Institute at Washington University in St. Louis. He's a communication strategist, policy analyst, and advocate with a passion for building communities dedicated to high impact change and advancing equity. Gary has spent more than two decades engaged in policy practice. You don't look like you could have been doing it that long, Gary. <laughs> First as a government employee, and then as a university-based policy analyst and researcher, he has partnered with policymakings at the state, local, and federal levels to develop, implement, and evaluate policies aimed at improving the health and mental health of children and families. As the former deputy director of the New York University McSilver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research, he led several community-based participatory research projects and collaborated with community and government partners to connect evidence-based solutions to policy decision-making. As the director of the Clark Fox Policy Institute, Gary leads a programmatic agenda driven by a commitment to advancing social and economic justice for children and adults who care for them. Through the Institute, he leverages a vast amount of transdisciplinary scholarship and community knowledge to inform critical policy issues. And it's my pleasure, having not met Gary before, to, to listen to him and to introduce him to everyone on the uh, session. So Gary, please take it away. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Special thanks to you, Rick and Jessica and Ariel and everyone who's been involved with the conference. Uh, uh, all of my favorite people are presenting at this conference, and uh, and you know we just saw Terry Mizrahi, who was my field instructor back in 1999, and uh, hopefully we can do a conference like this in person real soon. So you know there is a science to what we are doing, and I'm going to uh, dive into one of the research projects that I've had the great privilege of working on. This project was done in uh, cooperation with Hebrew University of Jerusalem, where I'm doing my doctoral studies under the mentorship of John Gall. And so very grateful for all that he has shared and, and, and taught me. And uh, this study is called Corporal and Cognizant Barriers to Voting, the Impact of COVID-19 on the 2020 Election Season in St. Louis. Slide two. In 2020, two critically important elections took place in Missouri. The first, held in August, put before voters an amendment to the Missouri Constitution that would expand Medicaid eligibility. And at the time, Missouri was one of only 13 states that had not adopted the Affordable Care Act. 
the second election in November uh, would determine the next president of the United States. During the 2020 election season, the country was also in the midst of two pandemics, COVID-19 and racial, uh, racialized violence. As the number of pandemic-related hospitalizations and fatalities grew, those without health insurance were increasingly vulnerable to medical debt and bankruptcies. The COVID-19 pandemic was disproportionately affecting communities of color and elders and highlighted the health and economic disparities that were longstanding within those communities. Because of the consequences of the pandemic, there was a heightened awareness for the need for access to affordable health care. Furthermore, increased attention was brought to the movement for racial justice when George Floyd, a black man in Minneapolis, died when a white law enforcement officer kneeled on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. This once again elevated the brutality experienced by black Americans when interacting with police. Protests organized by the leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement took place across the country with tens of thousands of participants chanting, I can't breathe, which George Floyd had repeated while pinned by the police. The large protests were held despite the potential of those gatherings to become super spreader events of COVID-19. Now, St. Louis, where this study is focused, had a, has a similar history of racial violence perpetrated by law enforcement. In August of 2014, a white police officer fired 12 bullets directed at a black teenager. Six of those bullets hit the intended target, resulting in the death of Michael Brown Jr. Following the deadly shooting, protests erupted, drawing attention to racial tensions between police and local residents in Ferguson, a small part of the county of St. Louis. Uh, the incident sparked a deeper discussion around the history of racism and inequality in St. Louis and the need for transformative policies that would create a more just and equitable society. After the death of Michael Brown Jr. on August 9th, 2014, Ferguson came to symbolize racialized strife and inequality in the United States. As a result of these intertwined pandemics, local community leaders in St. Louis City and St. Louis County emphasized a need for voters, particularly in communities of color, to engage in the elections in August and November as a tool for advancing health and racial equity. However, the circumstances surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic in particular created new challenges to connecting with eligible voters uh, and for voters to engage in the electoral process. These challenges can be divided into two typologies. The first is corporal, the use of one's physical body and uh, the, its potential risk. And the second cognizant, the regulatory proficiency needed to navigate the shifting rules of the voting process. Uh, engaging in the democratic process presented corporal risk that was higher within communities of color. As COVID-19 spread across the United States, communities of color were disproportionately impacted and more likely to contract and die from the disease. This was the result of generations of social and economic inequalities that undermine the health and mental health of populations of color. Furthermore, workers of color tend to be low wage earners in essential positions that would require close proximity to the public, thereby increasing their potential exposure to the virus. Limited access to protective equipment compounded the risk and data released by the St. Louis Metropolitan uh, Pandemic Task Force demonstrated that although uh, less than one fifth of the population in St. Louis was black, and that's St. Louis City and St. Louis County, almost 50% of all COVID related mortalities were black patients. And it's not just underlying health conditions that put populations of color at risk. It's a host of factors related to institutional racism. Now, little is known about how fear of the virus played into the decision-making process of community organizers and potential voters on whether or not they would participate in the 2020 elections. However, previous research uh, has uh, suggested that poor health is related to lower voter turnout. In multiple studies, those with self-rated poor health were consistency, consistently less likely to vote compared with those with good, very good or excellent health. While the impact of poor health on uh, voting behavior persists across age group, the effect of this finding increases with age. 
Voters need the knowledge and confidence to maneuver the cognizant challenges of voting and the pandemic was further complicating the process. The Constitution grants citizens the right to vote. However, it allows the states the ability to regulate the time, place, and manner of holding elections. And procedural burdens and shifting regulations have historically been created to disenfranchise voters. Complicated registration processes, poll taxes, literacy tests, and more have served as successful barriers to voting by citizens of color. In a stated effort to reduce the potential exposure to COVID-19, the state of Missouri implemented some temporary changes to the process of voting. The existing law dictated that eligible voters meeting certain criteria were able to request an absentee ballot that could be returned by mail or in person to the respective county board of elections. Absentee voters were required to present a government issued identification and some, but not all, were required to have their ballots notarized. For example, if you were active military or disabled, you did not need to have your ballot notarized. However, if you were incarcerated or you were going out of the election district on election day, notarization was required. It's important to note that contracting that the concern of contracting COVID-19 by voting in person was not a qualifying reason to receive an absentee ballot. In response to the limitation of absentee ballots, the state of Missouri passed legislation temporarily allowing for mail-in ballots, different from absentee ballots. Mail-in ballots were all of them were required to be notarized. Additionally, mail-in ballots had to be mailed and could not be returned in person. And voting rights groups filed lawsuits challenging several parts of arguing, quote, Missourians who seek to vote by mail this fall will face a confusing and burdensome regime that will result in widespread, unavoidable, and unconstitutional chaos and disenfranchisement, end quote. The court ultimately let the current ballot and notary rules stand. Unfortunately, the confusion caused by these new rules and the legal challenges set, you know, created a whole new set of cognizant barriers to voter engagement. And, you know, there are consequences for any decline in democratic participation, particularly by people with lower socioeconomic status. Low voter turnout among poverty impacted voters contributes to the ongoing existence of governmental policies and funding decisions that have negatively impacted those experiencing poverty and our people of color. Low-income voters are much less likely to vote or to be politically knowledgeable than high-income voters, which limits their influence and creates an upper income bias to effective public opinion. There were two uh, theoretical constructs that underpinned this research project, the theory of protection motivation, which is one you probably haven't heard before, and the theory of political efficacy, which I'm sure most people in this uh, conference have heard before. Now, political motivation theory is a cognitive model of behavior used to understand the response to perceived physical threats and describes the challenges of overcoming corporal risks to voting during a global pandemic. The theory consists of four factors, appraisal of the threat, the perceived vulnerability to the threat, the effectiveness of the risk preventative behavior and the ability to engage in that preventative behavior. The theory has been applied in numerous studies seeking to understand decisions of various populations impacted by COVID-19, including healthcare providers, tourists, consumers, employers in the workplace, vaccine recipients, and more. Organizers engaged in mobilization as well as uh, voters had to evaluate the overall threat to COVID-19, their particular vulnerability to that virus, if there were preventative measures that were effective, and then decide if they had the ability to adhere to those measures. During an election cycle, community organizers engaged in voter mobilization efforts on overcoming the cognizant challenges to voting by increasing the political efficacy of citizens. Now, as most of you know, the theory of political efficacy reasons that in order for citizens to vote, they must have the confidence that they have a firm understanding of the political issues and that the government will respond to their vote accordingly. If either of these beliefs are missing, the likelihood of participation is greatly diminished. Citizens with high levels of political efficacy are more likely to vote 
than those with lower levels. Now, internal political efficacy is defined as the confidence a citizen has in their knowledge about politics and policy. And the theory posits that the higher levels of internal political efficacy, citizens are more confident in their ability to advance their self-interests and the decisions they make at the ballot box will accurately reflect their values and goals. Conversely, with lower levels of internal political efficacy, they're less knowledgeable about political issues and uncertain about making an informed decision. External political efficacy you know, uh, refers to the extent a citizen has confidence that the government will respond to the demands of its citizens. And this requires a certain level of political trust, which reflects people's attitudes towards the functioning of government. The ultimate goal of Get Out the Vote mobilizers is for citizens to feel they are confident in pressing policy issues and that the government can and will respond to the will of the people. The interventions they employ are voter education, providing contact with candidates, voter registration drives, countless other tactics and strategies. And this can be challenging due to the structural barriers that have existed for generation that have led to an increase in disenfranchised voters. Now, through key informant interviews, this study documented the perceived ways in which get out the vote mobilizers were facing new barriers that discouraged and prevented electoral engagement by poverty impacted populations and voters of color. Time and resources were limited and these leaders were attempting to maximize the impact of get out the vote initiatives while in the midst of a global pandemic. And an increase in turnout has the ability to shift public resources to address unmet needs, particularly in the areas of healthcare and racial justice. Let's go through the methods. The collection of data happened between uh, April 2020 and January 2021. You know, as the data collected is an interesting point, uh, the both St. Louis City and St. Louis County issued public health protocols uh, in order to uh, uh, minimize the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. So although originally intended to be in-person semi-structured interviews, they were conducted and recorded via Zoom. Uh, as we know, we're on it right now, video conferencing platform, uh, which allowed for face-to-face -face connection as well as the ability to maintain those public health orders. Now the participants, uh, a combination of criterion and chain sampling was uh, utilized to identify these leaders engaged in mobilized efforts. Uh, and they were focused on uh, individual candidates, voter referendums and or nonpartisan voter registration and information efforts uh, within poverty impacted neighborhoods. Uh, the participants were eligible if one, they have or are engaged in get out the vote efforts they are or have been in a leadership position and a decision-making role for the initiative and are or have uh, aimed specifically at mobilizing eligible voters in poverty impacted uh, communities in St. Louis City and St. Louis County. Now the semi-structured interviews last about 45 to 75 minutes. Uh, they, the, we, you know, the semi-structured format allowed for flexibility of data collection and to understand the experience of those working on the front lines of voter mobilization, key themes were informed by the theoretical framework that I explained. Uh, and uh, more specifically, some questions included, what are some of the challenges you are facing as a result of COVID-19? In what ways has your approach to mobilization changed? And how are you protecting your health and safety? Uh, identifying and interviewing research subjects continued until there was a clear demonstration of saturation and redundancy. And uh, the transcriptions were individually reviewed for accuracy and de-identified by the research team. Now the research was done, as I mentioned, in collaboration with Hebrew University in Jerusalem and Washington University in St. Louis. So prior to any research, we went through the IRB process and it was approved. Now, uh, for the data analysis, a thematic analysis using both a deductive and an inductive approach were used. Codes were predefined based on the literature and theoretical framework and the research questions. And as the data analyzed, additional codes emerged and the code book was adapted as needed. The final code book had uh, 23 codes and two researchers coded the entire full data set using in vivo, which facilitated uh, collaboration among the research team. The discrepancies were minor and we met regularly to discuss and resolve them. Okay, next slide. So the research subjects, 53 mobilizers were approached 
21 did not respond after two requests. I may just say in their defense that I was collecting the data during the election. So they were busy with doing mobilization efforts. Uh, four responded, uh, agreed to be interviewed and then didn't respond to scheduling requests. Uh, but 28 community organizers stepped away from their work and responded and were interviewed for this study. Uh, eight subjects identified as black, one as Hispanic and 19 as white. 19 identified as female, nine identified as male, 12, they, this is the different types of campaign they were working on, 12 were mobilizing for a specific ballot initiative, could have been the Medicaid expansion, uh, four were working for particular candidates who were running for elected office, nine were focused solely on nonpartisan voter registration drives or information campaigns, and three were working on issue campaigns as well as for candidates. Now, COVID-19 created additional unforeseen corporal barriers to voting and mobilizers needed to ensure that they were protecting their health and the health of voters they contacted. Furthermore, the leaders of the city and county issued ordinances that mandated limited in-person gatherings and social distancing. And the measures taken on a personal and governmental level aimed at protecting the physical well-being of local citizens presented a serious obstacle to traditional voter mobilization efforts and created trepidation about in-person voting for fear of being exposed to the virus. So in response, the state of Missouri created new rules for absentee and mail-in voting, as I mentioned, understanding how to navigate through those rules in order to vote and have the vote deemed valid created a cognizant challenge that is compounded by the existing structural barriers that dissuade eligible voters. Voter identification laws, polling sites that are not easily accessible, limited in-person and early voting, lack of same-day voter registration, the purging of registration lists, et cetera, et cetera, all enhander the democratic process. Ah, okay, yes. Community organizers engaged in voter mobilization faced new challenges during the COVID-19 pandemic. And in March, 2020, mandatory stay-at-home orders were issued in an effort to protect the health of residents and slow the spread. As a result, public events were canceled and the opportunities to meet with large number of residents no longer existed. This prevented mobilizers from attending festivals and concerts and street fairs or other outdoor events that were often the setting for petitioning for voter referendums, voter registration drives, and campaigning for candidates as uh, uh, and ballot initiatives. One campaign consultant offered, we can't go outside uh, of stores trying to have petitioning there if you're, uh, if you're doing signature collection. We can't have fundraisers in person. We can't make a campaign video with a crowd of people to show the support. I think people are struggling to find out ways uh, uh, and ways of those things uh, I think people are struggling to find out how to do those things in ways that are also responsive to what's going on. It also prevented canvassing from door to door while the ordinances were in place through mid-May. This prevented candidates from visiting the homes of voters in their districts. The opportunity for candidates to build relationships with voters by meeting them face to face was diminished. And one organizer offered, yeah, we know what we know what to do is to knock on the door and talk to someone on their porch. And as organizers, you really believe that back and forth is important, end quote. Additionally, many or, uh, organizations were concerned about the safety of their workers and volunteers. Quote, we can't go to the doors. This year, my organization, my board voted against that. They didn't want to bring, they didn't want anybody bringing lawsuits or us having to sign waivers or anything like that. And I appreciate it. Recent studies have confirmed that individuals over 60 are at higher risk of contracting the virus, and many election judges and poll workers were elders. Polling sites had to be consolidated since the number of poll workers and election judges dropped, as many seniors did not want to risk being exposed to the virus. Uh, and in, in previous elections, uh, many polling sites were located in either senior housing or health facilities. And in, an, in another effort to protect the elder population, polling places were relocated so that the general public would not pass into those resident facilities. The relocation of polling sites is not new. Quote, basically every election, the polling places that you're supposed to go to seem to change, especially in areas where the population is more fluid, which makes it hard to vote, end quote. However, the number of sites that were changed or eliminated was reported to have reached new heights. Quote, 
half the number of polling locations are open, what is it going to look like in terms of lines wanting to vote? I mean, you can't be huddled together going into a building in November. Most people are going to be outdoors waiting because you can't be close together. Do you stand there and wait or do you walk away? End quote. Closing and relocating poll sites is shown to reduce voter turnout. Uh, transportation to polling sites is also another longstanding issue, particularly in low income neighborhoods that have limited access to public transportation. In pre-pandemic election, mobilizers organized volunteers to drive voters to, to the polls and COVID-19 presented health safety issues to these programs. Quote, we didn't wanna do the rides to the polls because you have to get in the car with someone and we didn't wanna expose our volunteers or the voters to getting sick. Cognizant challenges. These challenges in the rules and lawsuits created confusion among voters and mobilizations alike. Quote, I mean, our absentee uh, process was despicable. It's confusing. It's always changing. I mean, it was hard to communicate to voters. We didn't know what the rules were going to be. And it was really difficult. Quote, we tracked down what was happening at the polls and found that people working at the polls didn't even know what the rules were, end quote. And if a voter was able to determine that they qualified to participate via absentee or mail-in ballots, a kaleidoscope of rules and regulations had to be followed or their ballot would be invalidated. First, depending on the reason for voting absentee, a notary may be required and a voter must find a notary and bring their ballot to them in person. The next hurdle to the process it, to the mail-in is to mail in the ballot early enough so that it arrives by election day. The law requires that mail-in ballots be mailed by the US Postal Service and are prohibited from being returned in person. Quote, in Missouri, the ballot has to be received by election day and not postmarked by election day. Most people don't know that if you use the prepaid postage that it comes with, well, that acts, that's actually third class mail, not first class mail. So it could take several days to get there. If a voter qualified for an absentee or mail-in voting and had their ballot notarized and mailed it early enough so that it arrives on election day, their votes still might not be counted. If the form is not filled out with complete accuracy, it is disregarded. Furthermore, the Board of Election is not even required to inform the voter that their ballot has been invalidated. Quote, there's no legal obligation to contact people whose ballots are being rejected, and they don't record that anywhere in the voter file. So if I called them and said, was my ballot rejected in 2018? All they could say is, we just have on record that you didn't vote in 2018. So they don't even say that it was rejected. Voters from low income and poverty impacted neighbors, as well as senior citizens are particularly vulnerable. Quote, there are a lot of negatives to mail-in voting because low income communities and communities of color had their ballots rejected at a higher rate than others because you have to fill it out exactly, check every box, cross every T, dot every I, whatever it is. And any, if one, if any one of those things isn't done right, your whole ballot is rejected. The confusion around who qualified for absentee and mail-in ballots, what needed to be notarized, how to return the ballots, and the increased potential for votes to be invalidated created this new barrier to voting. And these complex rules discouraged voters. Quote, I think Missouri's convoluted absentee process and mail-in process is designed to be confusing and designed in a way that those votes actually don't count. So that's a problem that turns off voters. I mean, I think it's just hard, end quote. Many of the organizers saw the new rules as evidence of the continued effort to disenfranchise voters on the basis of race and socioeconomic status. One organizer say, I'd say it's systematic racism and the lack of access to resources and information. All because of that, you can't really blame people for not feeling like it doesn't matter what they think and not voting because of it. Neither internal nor external political efficacy takes into consideration the extreme confidence that it takes to engage in the electoral process. And although COVID-19 presented a unique set of factors, the elaborate set of rules that have been created in response will not completely dissipate when the immediacy of the pandemic subsides. You know, since the founding of the democratic process in the United States, structural barriers have been put in place that have contributed to generations of disenfranchised voters. And this study demonstrates 
that the corporal and cognizant challenges that community organizers faced as a result of the health dangers caused by COVID-19. Furthermore, the complicated response by the state of Missouri created new barriers with an implementation of a new set of rules that, con that confused voters and future research that quantifies the number of ballots that were disqualified for any reason and examines which populations were most impacted would demonstrate the, sh the true impact of shifting and multiplying rules and how they have affected the results of the 2020 election. Now, this study may be the first to gather qualitative data examining the impact of COVID-19 on the effort of co uh, get out the vote mobilizers, but it also has some limitations. The data was ex collected exclusively from individuals and organizations engaged in voter mobilization. Although the experience of voters was relayed, it was provided through the perspective of the mobilizers. Also, this study was conducted in St. Louis City and St. Louis County, and the, found, the findings may not be generalizable to the entire state of Missouri uh, or the United States, as each county is allowed some flexibility to adhere to the law. Now, I want to let you know there are two more papers that are coming out of this research. The first is Overcoming Barriers, because I know you're watching, how do they do it? Overcoming Barriers to Voter Engagement During the 2020 Election Season in St. Louis. And in order to lower the barriers facing voters, mobilize identified policies that would eliminate administrative hurdles placed on voters and shift the burden of facilitating democratic elections to the state. Findings from the study emphasize the need for structural changes that ensure the ability to engage in the electoral process, particularly among low income and poverty impacted communities of color. And then the second paper is a uh, quantitative paper that looks at race, poverty, and unemployment as quantitative predictors of voter turnout. Now, using county level and publicly available data from 12 Midwest states, similar to the demographic and cultural characteristics, uh, voter turnout in St. Louis City and St. Louis County were predicted using race, poverty rate, and unemployment rates. And the findings demonstrate that deep that, that despite high concentration of poverty rates and above average percentage of Black residents, voter turnout was significantly higher than predicted. So I look forward to finding opportunities to get those papers published. And then here are the endless list of references. I just also want to thank Ellen Huddy, who is my master's research fellow at the Clark Fox Policy Institute, uh, who with me did a whole lot of coding. Uh, and, uh, and she was really wonderful about it. And now she actually works for the St. Louis County Department of Health. So I'm very excited that she's putting her new knowledge into action. Thank you. Gary, thank you very much. The, uh, the policy and practical questions that you raise in your paper, I think will be uh, wonderful topics for a discussion here in a few minutes. Uh, I'm especially looking forward to hearing uh, you talk about how social work and social work profession can help people overcome these kinds of barriers. But I really like that conceptualization you have between corporal and corporate and, and, you know, and, cogniz and cognitive uh, barriers and, and how, to look, how to look at those. So I want to give a just want to give out a shout out to John Gall because he was the one that says you need a typology think this through, and I gave it some more thought and this is where it landed. So I'm so grateful for his mentorship. Well, John is a great person to force all of us to think a little more deeply about what whatever it is we're talking about. So shout out to John too. Well, let's turn now to the second group of uh, to the the next presenters. We have. Uh, Two, two people who um, I'm really looking forward to hear what they have to say. The topic is fascinating to me just from the title. Uh, first, we have Dr. Jason Ostrander. He's an assistant professor at Sacred Heart University's Department of Social Work, and he's the director of the Congressional Policy Practice Internship. He currently serves on the research committee and advisory board to the Humphreys Institute for Political Social Work, uh, and we heard uh, from Shannon Lane earlier today, so I know uh, you work with her extensively, and we'll have Suzanne Pritzker tomorrow, so you'll be right at home with those folks. Um, he received his PhD, let's see, but he's also the director of research for CRISP. Jason received his PhD from the University of Connecticut School of Social Work with a focus on political social work. 
and political participation and engaging oppressed and marginalized populations in policy development and process and politics. Jason's social work practice focuses on political social work, the political participation of social workers, program evaluation, and policy implications relating to marginalized and oppressed populations. So uh, Jason, I'm so glad you're here. Your co-presenter is Dr. Nubian Sun. Uh, she's an educator, scholar, and consultant, a native of Memphis, Tennessee. She earned her bachelor's degree in social work from the University of Tennessee, Chattanooga, and received her master's degree in social work, community welfare management from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. She obtained her, her doctorate degree in social work policy, planning, and administration from the Whitney M. Young Jr. School of Social Work at Clark Atlanta University. Her practice, pedagogy, and scholarship interests include the following. The Afrocentric Perspective, Women and Girls, Incarceration Reentry, and Self-Efficacy. She is currently a Clinical Assistant Professor of Social Work at Sacred Heart University, CEO and founder of the Center for Resilient Individuals, Families, and Communities, and CEO founder of Nubian Sun Consulting, LLC a multi a multi-social services consulting firm and so with that i would love to uh, turn it over to you both thank you so much uh, rick for that introduction um so we're going to talk about colonialism neoliberalism and diverse communities lived experiences with political systems um, this topic really comes to me from my teaching, um, anecdotally hearing students having um, what would be very white conversations around the lived experiences of the different people that they interact with both through policy, but also in individual, uh, individual work. And um, I often hear how uh, my students say, well, I, I don't need to talk about politics with my clients. That has, that has nothing to do with what's going on. And that unfortunately is not true because when you think of black, brown communities, other marginalized communities, people in power have a direct effect over what their lived experience is, whether it's through policy itself, laws, um, or whether it's through power over folks in um, agencies, in communities, through banking, and other means. So this is kind of our, uh, our presentation of trying to pull all these ideas together. So we're gonna do just a quick overview of colonialism and capitalism, um, then move into an overview of neoliberalism, and then we're going to try to tie the two together uh, through discussing its in, uh, their impact on diverse communities and then try to kind of tie it all together in our conclusion. So um, often in my classes, I try to talk about what is colonialism because by and large, my students don't ever know what it is. And so it really is colonialism is um, often the violent taking of geopolitical territory, the seizing of material resources, the exploitation of people through labor, and purposely interfering and dismantling political and cultural structures. We can see that more presently, if we think of like Puerto Rico, Hawaii, indigenous Americans, and especially the African American community who was brought here against their will. Um, and capitalism, which is really the partner of neoliber uh, neoliberalism, was established along with co uh, colonialism. When you really think of colonialism, it's it's the removal of of labor or resources um, from a particular place against what the native uh, population really wants or to their interest. Um, it's really for the uh, colon colonizer to reap the reward at the expense of those being colonized. Um, so colonizers made and implemented their decisions regarding the colonies based on their own home country interest. Um, you can think of 
Spanish, French, all these countries coming to the United States and taking over lands um, and really using them for their resources to take back to Europe. But it also gets into the next part, which is they did this through the constant power over by, by violence or oppression through slavery, rape, slaughter, um, and in many ways through hegemony, taking over education and understanding and valuing um, white normative ways of understanding and learning and engaging. Um, colonial control often included government control, constitutional powers, imposition or establishment of military bases and strategic locations, drafting colonized people into battle, think of Britain and India, um, control over prisons, law, mass media, and propaganda. Um, two subtle but powerful types of control really were education based on the culture and history of the colonizer and the imposition of the colonizer's religion uh, in place of an, an annihilation of indigenous spiritual beliefs and rituals. You're gonna to have to remember, I can't, oh, I can see the numbers, sorry, Nubia. I was like, I know I go to 11. I just wanna make sure I, I stop there. Yeah. Um, so when we're talking about neoliberalism, um, the social work literature describes and critiques neoliberalism on the 21st century social welfare policy and social work education policy and practice. I mean, much of this content really comes from Mimi Abramovitz, who's gonna be talking tomorrow. Unfortunately, she can't be here today. She texts me because she's got a conflicting meeting but it's really her last eight years of work um, that really has brought some of this to social work. Um, unfortunately, there is no common definition um, that exists. It, it, if you look at all the different professions, none of them have the same definition. Um, so when we're looking at neoliberalism, we have to think of it as um, it involves the application of conservative political thought and a capitalistic free market approach to all aspects of, a, of society. Neoliberalism has been used as an economic and political philosophy that has been used to understand both economic and social policy decision makings really in the US starting from the 1970s, really at the end of Nixon, beginning of Reagan. Um, and so the rise of US welfare state returning from two major ec uh, economic crises of the 21st century was the Great Depression in the 1930s and the fall in profits of businesses um, in the mid 1970s. So when you're thinking of neoliberalism, this can be experienced by a push from communalism to individualism, think rugged individualism, you got to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, even though in many places those bootstraps are long but broken. Um, it's all around free market, around privatization of public goods and services, um, and around deregulation. Deregulation is, uh, uh, regulation is seen as impeding the free market. Um, and these strategies look like tax cuts, which we had under, under Trump. Um, giving trillions of dollars away to the people who already have the highest uh, levels of wealth. Um, cutting funding to governmental programs uh, to help uh, folks in need. Retrenchment of fewer and smaller social programs. This kind of conversation is also coming up right now as we hear even Manchin and, and our social work colleague, uh, Kristen Senema. Uh, talk about what to do with this uh, stimulus bill that is coming up. Um, really devolution, pushing government programs from the feds back to the states um, through block grants or other ways. Um, privatization, as I talked about, think of prisons, think of um, in many in state like Florida, Child Protective Services is private. It's all private agencies doing all that work. Um, it's weakening the influence of social movements, really trying to prevent unionization and um, strikes or other ways to um, protest or rebel against what, what people feel are um, wrong policies and wrong, uh, wrong direction for our country. And really fall into this family values focus 
um, hearing much about family values as they talk about all these things that they're trying to do and keep referring to our society as being colorblind, which we know further marginalizes and, and oppresses um, other communities. So they're not seen. Is this me? Yes. Okay. Um, so when we're thinking of the first crisis, which happened in the 30s with the Great Depression and the New Deal, um, leaders blame the crisis on the market. So no regulation or little regulation um, and called for a more active state. So the federal government for the first time to really bail out everybody. So the New Deal programs that promoted this economic recovery did so by redistributing income downwards to the people who are in the middle class and, and lower middle class and, and those in poverty and really expanded the role of the state. Thanks to Social Security Act, um, Medicare, not Medicare, Medicare, one of them, old age insurance. Um, and they help businesses. They really help banks um, to protect assets of those who had um, monies in them, farmers from losing their property, workers, and some families who overall were mostly white to get back on their feet. Um, home ownership was a key to wealth during uh, post-World War II in America, and it really continues to be now. Um, and uh, we have to keep mind uh, on the fact that there were still discriminatory and segregated policies that were imposed by uh, the FHA, <clears throat> excuse me, along with discrimination by white community developers, banks, housing associations, um, even uh, Eisenhower's interstate highway system really was, you know, sour deal for African-Americans in our country. Now we will continue the conversation um, into thinking about the expansion of the welfare state. And we'll take some time to think about how all of these pieces um, impact diverse communities and conclude um, with our things we have discussed today and hopefully a charge to you all and beyond this room of next steps and continuing um, this fight against colonization and against capitalism and dismantling the systems um, in which we commit to doing so. So in the 1940s, uh, the expansion of welfare state looked like a, was, a group, was a growth and a response uh, of population growth. The, emergency, the emergence of new needs, um, increased revenues, uh, greater administrative capacity and the victories over increasingly active social movements. Um, this period is said to have saved uh, capital capitalism from itself. Um, expanded government role, which led to economic growth, less poverty, um, more equality, created conditions for profitable economic activity that benefited businesses and industry. These welfare policies uh, continue uh, they, they were created and they continue to this day to uplift white communities and stigmatize families of color. Looking at expansion of the welfare state from 45 to in, into the 70s, national elite blame their economic problems on, on the big government and call for shrinking of the welfare state. Business, businesses became less reliant on US workers and uh, victories of social movements raised the economic cost of businesses and political costs of maintaining social peace. Uh, Neoliberalism would restore um, the primacy of the market by undoing the New Deal in the 30s and the Great Society in the 60s and 70s. And we can also uh, witness this um, through the examination of looking at Reaganomics and the trickle down theories. And moving to the thoughts around neoliberalisms and colonialism's impact on diverse communities, I want us to think about uh, the idea and the plague of dehumanization. Um, all of these pieces that we're speaking about today have to do with the intentional dehumanization of systems. 
I want to bring in this quote to ground us as we begin this portion of our conversation uh, with a quote from one of my unpublished manuscripts. As the removal of humans from national citizenship persists, racism is permitted to pollute multiple political and social systems as a method of control and production. In thinking about uh, colonization and dehumanization, it is not only a domestic issue, it's an international issue. And thinking about the negritude movement, um, a movement that occurred in the 30s, and it consisted of a few um, Black Francophone scholars emerging from the Caribbean and from the continent of multiple countries in Africa who came together to form these pieces of thought and these pieces of strategy around addressing colonization. And they also at that time began to share and to build relationships with uh, folks during the Harlem Renaissance, such as Claude McKay. And through this time, the thought process was around how do we combat colonization? How do we create um, our, our, our joint vision through our various lenses, through our economic lenses, through our poetic and literary lenses, through our social justice lenses, and so forth. So um, I may say Zare, a Martiniquean um, literary who's uh, professed the father of negritude, uh, wrote in the discourse of colonialism that um, the piece around thingification and his expression of thingification is where the colonized human is a commodity and is robbed of their personhood and indigenous way of life. He also goes to say, no human contact but relations of domination and submission which turn the colonizing man into a classroom monitor, an army um, sergeant, a prison guard, a slave driver, and the ingenious man into an instrument of production. He also goes to express a civilization which justifies force and domination is an, an existing sick nation and is morally bankrupt. And looking deeper into uh, dehumanization and combining the thoughts around uh, thing, thing vacation and taking um, away the humanity, stripping people away from the humanity, um, let's look at the definition of one of the mm -hmm. definitions of, of dehumanization, which is the denial of one's membership uh, to humanity. And um, it is often seen and reported in extreme contexts such as genocides and rape and, and murder. And um, is also found in everyday interactions. Some early psychological theories view dehumanization as an extreme uh, phenomenon that plays ethnic and racial group interactions. But we know that dehumanization can also incur um, in intergroup contexts and is not limited to conflict um, and is a part of everyday society and is rooted in sociocognitive processes. So in looking at dehumanization rooted in everyday society, it is rooted in all of the systems that we interact with. It is rooted in our religious systems. Oftentimes, religion is, is used as a weapon. There's discrimination and even um, the continued evidence of colonization um, and using religion as a weapon to do so. Um, academic institutions, um, evidence of dehumanization exists there. Uh, through the curriculum, through the policies, uh, what uh, many of us call academic hazing, um, through promotion processes, also um, the, beha the behavior around the treatment of historically marginalized groups through the culture and, and, and often the very air um, in, in academic uh, institutions can be dehumanizing. Jails, prisons, and detention centers, um, the, humaniz the humanization takes place through the privatization, 
through the lack of, of human rights, water, um, access to, to clean air, access to adequate um, living standards, reproductive needs, um, forced labor, solitary confinement, convict leasing policies and, and, and et cetera, especially around the privatization as we have seen for a while, uh, many of the private uh, prisons and entities have been investing in um, community-based entities, such as uh, foster care, group home, mental health entities, and, and, and even uh, re-entry focused uh, nonprofits um, have, have received uh, funds and are in partnership with uh, private uh, private detention in prisons. Also around the definition of labor and the value of labor, we have this undertone in our society, society about uh, what's worthy and who's unworthy, what labor is worthy and what labor is unworthy as it relates to right, as it relates to overall care. Uh, we battle with uh, living slash a, th a thriving wage so people can not only have their basic needs but have the need their needs met so they can thrive we we go back and forth depending on who we're relating the conversation around with the the definition and the value of sex work even domestic care and and the environmental management when I think about environmental management, I think about our trash collectors um, and, and the value of labor has existed a long time. And I think about um, Dr. Martin Luther King and his uh, work and um, the political action around um, the sanitation march and the rights for sanitation workers in Memphis, Tennessee in the 60s. Language. Uh, the humanization around labeling and stigma, corporations, um, the, human, the humanization around developing strategies and the strategies for ultimate production. Um, Jason and I were, were talking about uh, corporations want to make money and spend less money <laughs> and um, ex expo exploitation of people and land and resources and culture and communities. The medical um, industrial complex, um, thinking about the origin of, of uh, certain medical uh, facets, especially gynecology, um, as it uh, in the horrible uh, origins during slavery, um, access and treatment of LGBTQ individuals, um, psychiatry, and that complicated um, past and still you know, a long way to go as it relates to um, um, how folks are fared um, in, in, in the care of mental health. Uh, childbirth, uh, many folks are, are still not able to have uh, safe child, childbirthing experiences. Um, healthcare access, um, discrimination, the, the attitudes around folks of color and the, the the horrible theories around uh, uh, their uh, expressing of pain or needs for care uh, being ignored or the superhuman thought that especially black women cannot feel pain or our tolerance is, is high or we couldn't possibly know what we're talking about when we, when we express our needs or, or feelings of pain or harm. The nonprofit industrial complex, complex. I, I um, put in quotations, hunger games, and that's related to the funding strategies of many of uh, the funders, where this, this carrot of funding is dangled in the middle and everyone is scrambling to get this, 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 this small carrot um, of funding. Philanthropy and um, often ties to, uh, to colonization and to other um, other facets, um, not only foundations, but um, other other pieces. Um, and I, I look forward to another conversation around reparations and, and uh, philanthropy later. Um, also the inequality of funding. You have um, folks directly impacted, you know, bearing the brunt of, of the work and, and the funding is very low compared to other uh, entities um, that are moving um, similar work, but, but gaining more support and more funding. And I also put um, unlock, unlikely bedfellows. 
um, as a term I usually use around um, funders. Um, such as, you know, uh, private prisons and private, private entities um, and none, excuse me, nonprofits being um, in bed with them and um, having, getting funding and being controlled. Um, and uh, I know we talk a lot in our policy classes around um, the implications of, of being a 501c3 and the political implications, especially. And um, the, uh, another another conversation would be great to talk about um, how these uh, private entities, um, you know, give money and have funding for nonprofits. But what what does that leave us in in terms of um, our ultimate goal as social workers and our deeper uh, commitment to advocacy and, dis and dismantling capitalism and um, rehumanizing uh, the people um, that we serve and, and ourselves as well. Food, water, land communities, uh, gentrification, displacement, unsafe housing, especially ecologically uh, unsafe housing. Here in New Orleans, uh, we have various communities and one community um, and mine is Gordon Plaza that was knowingly built on top of a uh, toxic sewage dump and uh, was, was modeled as this, this dream of, um, of a middle-class beautiful suburban neighborhood where middle-class, um, you know, Black folks could come and, and pass on the wealth of home, um, home ownership. But as time passed and even till today, um, folks have uh, lost their lives and have continued to live with various um, health concerns, various cancers, uh, various skin conditions, uh, res respiratory conditions from living in the toxic waste dump and um, and, uh, and many of them are not able to leave because all of their assets are tied into their home with the promise of, of wealth and passing it down to, to their children. Also state sanctioned violence and this list can go on and on and on. These are a few ways um, that dehumanization exists in our systems. Police violence, uh, forced sterilization of black and brown folks, uh, control of the reproductive body as, as, as many of us are in high alert um, around um, the abortion bans and the continuous pieces um, that we see around the control of, of, of the reproductive body in prisons and jails, um, entities, um, you know, uh, trying to negotiate, you know, uh, serve time through taking, you know, uh, advanced birth control or sterilization, uh, many things um, like that. Also, uh, slavery, abortion access, and healthcare. So, um, all of these systems we are we are in and out of. We work in. Um, we and some of us defend. Um, all of these these systems we are deeply impacted by. And um, as we as social workers uh, continue to move and and the rehumanization of things, it takes a critical look um, as we prededicated ourselves to the profession, it's time to take a critical look um, at, at our political foundation, especially of our theories and our praxis. Um, take a inside out look at um, our, our part and our role um, as, as we have been um, existing so far in the future, not only of social work, but, but the folks uh, we claim to, to assist in the liberation of. Um, as we have been speaking, racism, dehumanization, and thingification are all married to capitalism. And as these political tactics centered in dehumanization continue to evolve, we must continue to evolve. And center to that e evolution is a critical internal audit of our profession for the things we fight to dismantle even exist in our own house. Um, here are some things for further conversation and, and further reflection um, around uh, ways forward. And taking all of this that we have discussed today, thinking about ways forward. We must re rehumanize 
our social work curriculum and policies and culture and our social work schools, our programs, our licensure process, our credentialing, our regulation and our research. We must rehumanize by creating a brave overhaul, a brave, you know, some may say walk of faith, a move of, 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 of uh, courage, of trust and our, and our commitment and trust in our communities and um, intentionally aid and, li and liberation. And that trust in that community and that trust um, in our commitment uh, looks like uh, us believing in, 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 our, in, our, uh, in the people um, that we serve, believing um, that they are more than capable of, of and, and we also talk about this a lot in class about the, the client and we know that clients, um, the client term is exists differently across the spectrum of systems. But we trust, we need to trust better and know that they are experts in their own experiences. And, and that needs to be evidenced by our behavior and our modeling and our action of, of these pieces, especially these bigger systemic pieces that we fight to dismantle. Our, we need to... Uh, to model and to exhibit more trust in that commitment. Um, also, we need to recenter and support folks who are directly impacted um, by the social ills. And that support not only looks um, like hiring people, but uh, and and retention. Just thinking about building, you know, building our whole um, and building the intention around our programs around all of our, our strategies against uh, dehumanization with centering folks and being led by folks uh, directly impacted. And um, it takes a great, a great uh, it, it takes being brave, it takes a great intention and a great love to, to want to center and restructure uh, for the better good, but, it, but it's time. Also, we need to examine our dual professional identities and systems. Uh, for example, being a social worker in a detention center and being a social worker organizing to dismantle carceral systems. We need more examination of our dual, our dual identities. And lastly, um, we need to co-create and implement more anti-racist policies that are that are rooted in dehumanization and hold not only the officials but ourselves accountable for the desired outcomes. And that concludes uh, the, the first portion of our talk together. And here are our references. And uh, we sincerely thank you for this opportunity in this space, especially during this time of COVID and, um, and ecological unrest and political unrest. So we're opening up for questions. Well, I wanna uh, just uh, start off by saying thank you very much for the presentation. It's challenging, but it seems to be right on target. Um, we, we have a, a few questions that will be uh, for all three of you, and some that may be a little more specific to one presentation or another. But I, I think what they have in common uh, is that there is uh, the focus on systems mm -hmm. and uh, not so much on individual social worker uh, you know, actions like we, we may have uh, been talking about earlier this morning. But I'd, I'd like to ask all three of you to just um, do a little conversation with us about given the systemic nature of the issues that you're talking about, and Gary, you're talking about a system that very um, planfully, you know, kind of restricted voting rights uh, during the pandemic. Um, you know, what, what is it that we sh should take away given the theme of our conference or a symposium of amplifying the voice of social work in policy? I have a general question, but um, uh, I'll just let anyone start who, who uh, wants to take that on. Jason, it looks like you. Everyone else is <laughs> um, I'm thinking of how to take that question on. Um, 
I don't know. I think a lot of when I teach, um, I teach lots of people who really want to finish, you know, social work and go and be therapists, clinicians, which is fine. It's a great job. I really try to help my students understand there's a difference between your professional identity as a social worker and the job that you hold. And we really need to keep those things separate um, because our profession really highlights what we should be doing through our ethics and our mission and vision. Um, and it will come into conflict with our job 100%. But I think until we can get more of our students to understand that um, it really is our systems that are hurting people, that are harming people, that are oppressing people, um, until we can get our students to really want to grab hold. I mean, I do work on political efficacy as well. And to, to get them to a place where they believe through critical consciousness that they can make change, um, they're just not going to. I mean, I, I see it as we have to force them to practice these skills in schools so they feel comfortable enough to where they can go and want to change these systems that truly at the heart of it further prop up people who look like me and further hurt people that look like Nubian. Um, we do a lot of lip service to it, but when it actually comes to the work of it, um, I think that that's where we're failing. Thank you. Um, Gary or uh, Nubian, further thoughts? Yes, you know, Jason, I, I, I totally agree with you. There, there are many social workers that, that are attracted to the school because they want to, they want to help in some way. And, and I think they have the most direct contact with seeing clinicians in practice. And then they say, oh, I want to do that. That's going to help people. And then they get into school and realize like, wait, I want to help people on a much bigger level than on the individual and family level. And that's a great thing. And, and, and also, I also tell students here that, you know, um, it's wonderful that you are going to be a clinician because it's important to have that community connection. But you will be surprised how quickly you are going to move up into a leadership position where you will no longer be able to have those kinds of clinical relationships and will need to have a fundamental understanding of policy and how to advocate for the populations that you serve. And, you know, uh, my perspective and the perspective that we've heard from so many of the presenters today, you know, is that we need to use voting as a tool for policy change. Uh, and I also want to recognize in the audience, we have uh, Gina McClendon, who's done uh, some amazing work in this area as well. Uh, and, you know, because voting is social work. My, my first job out of graduate school was working for an elected official. So I got kind of thrown into the, the deep end right away. And boy, did I absolutely love it. Um, and it really kind of shaped me. But I remember when Terry Mizrahi was my uh, uh, was my field instructor and she was part of NASW. We went down to city hall. She handed me testimony that she had written and she said, okay, go present it to the city council. And before I know it, I'm like sitting in front of the city council, like reading a statement that I did not write and had to learn all of the kind of skills that Allison was talking about in the previous session of like, it's okay not to know the answer to questions. So I, I think we need to find more opportunities for this type of, you know, the policy engagement. There's policy as a product and an analysis, and, it, and so many of our students are getting that in their classwork. P policy is a process, how to engage, how to get those words on a page to move into action is something that I don't think that we spend a lot of time working on. And there are, you know, Real easy ways. You, you don't have to like hand somebody a testimony and throw them in front of a city council on the second day of their field placement. Uh, thank you, Terry, uh, for them to get that experience. But, the, but there are ways, particularly now with Zoom, to be able to allow students access to see community process, to see it on the local level to, and to see it on, a, on the state and, and federal level. So I think we need to, as we're thinking through curriculum, as we're engaging with students, 
find ways to engage in policy process to amplify the policy product. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. three, three things very briefly, because we can talk all day and I love it. <laughs> um, one thing with curriculum, um, many of us, uh, our institutions have a, have a binary um, eye. They have a, you're either macro or, or micro. And I think um, justice would, would, would be um, really sweet to put policy in all of it all throughout. Because um, one thing we talked about at, at the budding of the, of the pandemic was telehealth. Tele telehealth uh, was a political move, is a policy move because we've been fighting for telehealth for years. Um, and it's ties uh, with capitalism. You know, we, we, can, we can talk about this all day, but um, yeah, the, the, the telehealth impacted folks in, in direct practice. Um, and also folks uh, were continuously fighting around that and are continuously, you know, engaging in conversation and action around increasing the, num the amount for insurance um, to reimbursements and things, so all of those affect your private affect your your private practice and our political issues. Um, also, when I'm um, speaking with students, we get some students. I think I was one of them. Oh, I don't want to do macro social work. <laughs> I want to help. I want to go into therapy. And uh, my first job was <laughs> was was and most of my experiences of split with direct practice, uh, even though I'm, a, I'm, um, I'm both, I'm a um, macro and, and a, a clinical community practitioner. And um, I always say to them that um, looking at things in the macro context um, helps you, you inform, greatly inform your, your direct practice in a way, because uh, many of the pieces of direct practice centers around the problem of the individual. Um, but our macro thought helps us to, to look at, hey, it is, it's not Johnny's fault um, all the way. There's, there's other people and it helps re us really hone in on the person in their environment, not their, their immediate environment, but the whole system and, their his and the chronos of how, of how things um, continue to manifest. And the third thing, um, around uh, we need more yes engagement with students, um, not only uh, creating those opportunities, but, but um, educators modeling those, those experiences uh, with voting and with organizing. Uh, one of my hats and, and uh, many of my, most of my family are organizers. And I say organize, organize, organize. Um, um, voting is one thing and um, I, I, I constantly um, look at um, the idea around advocacy. It, 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 to students, I see it looking as like this light thing. We're gonna advocate for this person, advocate, advocate. And um, I always push and think like deeper. You need to organize around that advocacy, build base around that advocacy and around and being, being out in the community and being with entities um, to, to, to listen and to learn and unlearn and to build, build power. Because after these bills are passed on paper, uh, we can celebrate for about an hour and then we have to continuously work and organize for the implementation, hold people up, you know, uh, but it is a constant work um, because many of our bills, we haven't seen the fruits of, uh, we've seen them on paper, but uh, especially through generations, uh, we haven't um, seen the fruit of, um, of, of that particular labor around those bills. So those main three things, um, I think, uh, yeah, from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> Probably more often than not. <laughs> well, um, I'm, uh, someone else? Oh, I was just gonna, piggyback off of one thing that uh, yes. being said, which was, so this morning I taught a specialized practice class. Um, and one of the things that often comes up, I, we have been doing case examples and simul uh, simulation. And um, we had one of the cases was about an African-American woman. And um, 
trying to use CBT. Um, and one, uh, and so of course this is a learning experience and many of them um, were talking about the woman's exposure to racism and oppression, although they didn't put that thought right there. They were just going based on what the symptoms were that the woman was experiencing, but they, in essence, were trying to use CBT to get rid of those thoughts um, without paying homage to the fact that she was experiencing racism. She was experiencing oppression. She wasn't getting the job that she was very much qualified for. She wasn't able to get a mortgage with a, a, a realistic uh, interest rate um, compared to a white family. And so I think we also have to be mindful, even in, in micro practice, that if we discount those levels of oppression and marginalization and say that potentially using CBT, that it is you know, something that we've developed in our head and we have to try to overcome that, we are completely losing the lived experience of clients. Um, and I, th I think that that is also so very important in all of this because that lived experience is important and it, and it needs to be held up and understood. Oh yeah, Jason, and um, one, one um, piece of that too is many times it's why our, our interventions fall through the cracks because of the lack of the macro context, because of the systemic thoughts um, and, and the dehumanization is built in the interventions. And that's built in the theories that the, the uh, practitioner is using to evaluate and assess the clients. Mm -hmm. Well, Annabelle has put in the uh, chat, um, uh, she says, Trauma Theory Without Feminism by Emma Zaris is a really good paper about that, how we tend to pathologize the effects of trauma, not the trauma itself. So um, just wanted to, to uh, emphasize that that's there. Um, we are running a little low on time. We're supposed to end in about four minutes. And so I, I hesitate to ask any more questions because this topic is so vast. That, uh, I feel like the, the guy is on CNN saying, well, can you quickly tell me in, you know, in 30 seconds, uh, you know, what's the history of racism in the United States? <laughs> so um, I, I think uh, the, the question that would be posed uh, if we had more time was, how do we deal, as many of us are educators, and I have to say that even social work education can feel very dehumanizing, not only to students, but to faculty. And if we wanna look at the adjuncts and the, it's, uh, you know, there, there's a whole industry here that dehumanizes as much as anyone else. Uh, so I, I'm gonna just kind of leave that as an unanswered question. Um, I, I want to thank all three of you for stimulating and, and uh, presentations that, that are not easy to know what to do with in the sense that the issues are so big. But I think that you also, all three, give us hope that there are ways to move forward. Uh, and past generations of social workers and activists have made those same decisions to Yes, it's difficult, but we're going to uh, move ahead. And um, in the song, we shall overcome. It may be a while, maybe a very long time, but we can all take steps in that direction. So thank you very much. And uh, it's uh, about time to say bye. <laughs> so bye, everyone. It's been great. <laughs>